Okay, so this is lecture 34 of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to build upon the technology and sort of the approaches that we devised in the last several lectures with respect to spread spectrum communication systems, and we're going to look at the most critical module of that system, which is the PN sequence generator. Right? So remember what we did in the last class, and I think it's probably best that I illustrate it through diagrams. So let's see. So remember what we did last class. So I I told all of you, right, that suppose I have this in the frequency domain. I have a signal, okay? So that's AW signal. And what ends up happening is if I pass this guy and multiply him with a PN sequence that came from a PN generator, okay, what happens is if I choose, so on the side, so here's my time domain signal of information, right? And then let's say the PN sequence in time consists of really narrow chips. Hmm, that makes me hungry. So what happens is we have chips, and that's the chip period. And we have the bit rate here, right? What happens is, when you do this combination of these signals together, what you end up getting is essentially spectrally, depending on what your processing gain is. Okay, so gain processing. So let's say it's a factor of 1,000, or, let, okay, maybe not 1,000. Let's say 10. That requires me to erase. What happens? Okay, what happens is my spectrum now spreads by a factor of 10, and it's one-tenth the energy across it. So energy is conserved, but redistributed across frequency, right? So that's, my, that's AW's spreaded signal. Now, what do we desire when we implement the PN sequence, right? How do we engineer this? And the thing is, is that we want essentially a PN sequence that has the following properties. So we want a PN sequence that with itself is white. We only want it to be correlated with itself and otherwise is totally uncorrelated, right? Because what happens is, um, suppose we don't synchronize at the right point. So like this is the big problem with 3G systems, with spread spectrum systems in general at very high data rates, and their chip rates are insanely high. Is the, the issue of, let's say they're not perfectly in sync, what happens? You're not going to spread. It's almost like a key. If you put the key, let's say I take this key out, one of several, it's all, this is, the reason why I have such a big keychain is not because I have a lot of important stuff to lock away, but we, we do live in Worcester, right? So, no, just kidding. Yeah, no, no. It literally is, I have a lot of useless keys for nothing. Um, so this is my office key. Uh, yes, down to the decimal. What happens is, if you insert it only halfway through into the keyhole, do you get to open the door? No. You have to align it perfectly with the tumblers inside of the lock in order to get in. Same thing with the PN sequence. If it's not perfectly aligned with how your signal spread, it ain't going to spread, right? And that's desirable, right? We don't want people, like, on the one hand, we don't want sort of flukes and say, oh, I think this kind of correlates. Let's spread here. And then it's just a disaster train of errors and such like that. But at the same time, the issue is if you don't synchronize perfectly, you don't decode the message. And at very high data rates, that becomes a very challenging proposition. Okay? The other desired property is, I want, like, you know, imagine... Oh, imagine. Like, you know, I'm not sure how many of you have tried. Like, you know, um, so depending on, let's say, the t like, haven't you ever gone into a parking lot? And let's say you drive a specific type of car, and you go in, you open your car, you go into the seat, and then it's like, I don't, I don't remember that air freshener hanging from my rear view mirror. Hmm, okay, and you just drive out, right? 
Little did you know that you went into the Ford Focus of, let's say, some complete stranger that happened to park next to your Ford Focus, but because of that key, you opened up their door. Uh, this happened a few times, very embarrassing-like. Uh, with my uh, Toyota Corolla, I went in and said, what's going on? Where are my maps? Where's my GPS uh, holder thing? And it's like, no, it's someone else's car. So it happens. It happens. Yeah. So anyways. So what happens is that's the risk. Imagine now, let's say Mustafa, you initiate a call. Or better yet, how about I initiate a call and my PN sequence, let's say it's a CDMA type phone, says, oh, you're, you're, you're Mustafa. And then, oh, we're just going to charge his account. You know, not good. That's commercially not acceptable. I would get really upset. Or eavesdropping, let's say it's like, Oh, so that's what they have to say about me. Okay, okay, you know, just like, you know, that's like, imagine it's like, you know, whatever communication is going across, let's say by fluke or whatever, my PN sequence is really close to your PN sequence and I just begin eavesdropping, right? It's just like, you know, that's, that's pretty darn bad. What happens is we want, if we're going to create PN sequences, they've got to be totally cross-correlation between different PN sequences. They've got to be like Mars... Venus, Earth, Mercury, they should be planetary far apart, as uncorrelated as possible. Even partial correlation could be very dangerous. The other thing is, with itself, we want to make sure that the PN sequence aligns perfectly at the desired sampling instant and nowhere else. So how do we go about doing this? The way we do it is as follows. So there are two types of, there are two types of ways of spreading. Okay. <sighs> And those ways are the following. So you can either use something called an M sequence generator, and I'll describe it in the notes in a few minutes. And my other favorite is gold sequence, because they're golden. No, because they're, the guy who invented them is called gold. <laughs> so what happens is um, that these two types have their advantages and disadvantages. So M sequence generators, as we're going to see, Beautiful. They're made up of shift registers. Beautiful thing, right? And there's all this module two adding business, and you just sort of feed the sequence back into itself. You have some periodicity. It's fantastic. Problem with M sequences? I, I don't like surprising people, so I'm going to say what the problem is. They suck in terms of cross correlation properties. Or they don't do as well. There's just too much. They, they don't do so well in terms of cross correlation properties when your sequences are extremely long because you get partial hits. That's super bad. If anybody kind of detects that, you're not, not doing well. Gold sequences on your hand are actually quite nice. And we'll look at that right now. Okay. Yeah, it's not very professional to say, this thing sucks. Imagine you go work. Like, imagine if your PhD advisor or your boss at work or something like, comes up and says, you know what, Bob? I think this thing sucks, you know? Unless you have a really good relationship with your PhD advisor or boss, that's not something you want to hear, okay? Let's just say M sequences could do a little bit better. Yeah, positive reinforcement. So what happens is, let's look at maximum length shift register sequences, okay? Otherwise known as M sequences. And so these guys have a, have a length of L. But you might say, okay, what's this M business? What's this L business? So essentially what your M sequence generator looks like is this. You've basically got something going, so it's, it's all binary. And you do this, this weird addition thing at the bottom, right? And so what you do is, let's say you have some sort of initialization stage for all the stages of your shift register. And then every clock cycle, step forward, right? So sequences begin to flush out of the output. But then, at several stages, I feed it back into this little adder business, this module 2 adder. And then it, the response of that gets shoved back into the shift register at the adder end. So it never empties out. And what happens is, the, the theory behind this is, so you have m stages of your shift register, and then the length, OK? So you know you have this guy. He produces L, and L 
in total is 2 to the m minus 1. So you're going to have periodicity every l, um, uh, every l uh, bits, right? And so the way it works is you feed this, your, your, um, your, your, you know, let's say several of these stages, not all of them, and then you feed it back. And what's really cool is if I want to make a unique combination, I get rid of a line or make another line to another part of the stage. I can use different numbers in order to create a different PN sequence, right? So you can create a variety of different types of PN sequences, and this is intuitive, right? It's like it's all sort of like computer engineering like shift registers, binary sequences. You can make the, like, you know, what would be really cool, like I'm trying to think, like a Christmas gift, if any of you are handy with PCBs and stuff, how about this? Make one of these things, put on a nice green PCB, and you just see this progressively just, you know, feed out bits and stuff. Like, here's my PN sequence generator, and then give it to someone you love. And say, you can make your own PN sequence, like, you know, map it, you know. I'm just thinking of, like, great Christmas ideas, you know, like, if you have any loved ones. And, you know, because all around campus, I'm, like, seeing the little digital WPI clocks and, you know, the little digital Christmas tree and stuff. I'm thinking, sequence generator, that's what we need. That and the 555 timer. OK. So here's an example of how you can wire up your PN sequence generator, your NM sequence generator, and how you can wire stages at different points. So let's say if you have two stages, you can like connect both one and two. And that's probably, you probably need to do that. Three stage, maybe the first and last stages, you sort of feed into that, that adder, the module two adder to create a new one. And then so on and so forth. And these are all just suggestions. You can make any sort of wiring that you want, right? So, OK, so conceptually, so how does this look like? J just to drive this point home before we go into the math. Or maybe it's my attempt to avoid the math. Only time will tell. OK. So what happens is the way it works. So how many stages is that? Eight. Okay. Then you have your modulo two adder. We have your output. Okay. So suppose I take this stage, um, and I take this stage. Maybe that's too many because this is going to take forever. But let's say we initialize with something, something like that. You know, just for fun. Okay. So how does modulo two work? Any thoughts? So if it's two of, hmm? XOR. It's an XOR. OK. So what happens is, what happens if I take two of the same? What does the XOR do? And so if it's two ones or two zeros, and if it's different, then it's a one, right? So right now, what happens is, let's go through clock cycle number one. So what do I get? So I have 0, 0. So I know that that's going to create a 1. So let's use a different color. No, 0. Sorry. So what happens is now I shift everything out. So the first output, the first output, hmm, this thing is not behaving, is going to be a 0. Shift everything over. Uh, yeah, now I know why I don't want to do eight stages. <laughs> okay. So now what it is? One, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. And then this guy, zero. Correct? Next. So we flush things out again. Now it's a one. So... If memory serves, still zero. it's still going to be, uh, yeah, so, so what happens is 1, 1, so that will be a 0. So that will be 1, 1, so 0. And then everything gets, so, next out, so the output is 1. So what do we get? 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 
1, 0. Yep. So my memory only is like two shift registers deep. So I'll stop here. But does everyone sort of get the point? So I'm not going to do it 2 to the 2m plus 1. This is going to take an awful, hmm? Yeah, I'm not going to do it for L, otherwise I'm going to go insane. But everyone sort of gets the point. You create this really long, let's say, 128 or 256 long bit sequence. It's repetitive, but why do we call it pseudo-random? Because the idea that we want it to look like noise, unless you have the exact matching PN sequence at the exact matching time. And then it ain't looking like noise anymore. It will, decorrel it will basically despread your signal very nicely. That's desirable. Okay? So if we go back now, I talk about pseudo-random and I talk about white noise, and we want this thing to look like noise, right? But noise that we predict and has periodicity, that's why it's kind of pseudo, right? It's a great cop-out. It's basically, oh, it's pseudo-random. It's not completely random, right? Just like pseudocode. I'm too lazy to show you the entire C file, so I'll just write some smattering of something that looks like a code, right? Pseudo. Today's secret word. So what happens is, suppose we use, instead of ones and zeros, we use ones and minus ones, okay, to represent one and zero. This guy here is essentially our discrete time correlation function. And what does it do? What essentially it does is, for every m value, so for every so what we're doing is essentially, here's c of n, here's c of n, no shift. What is the correlation value? Now, I offset them by one. What, how do they correlate now? Offset them by another one, and another one, and another one. So I go through all m values, and I see how do they correlate with each other, right? And the problem is, maybe for, that's for that particular sequence, correct? So what I would like to do is, let's say, average it across let's say, all possible combinations and such. And uh, because let's say for all possible, like, let's say if we have a single PN sequence, that's one thing. But let's say we have a family of PN sequences. What is the autocorrelation property now of that family? So we're going to have to take the expectation across all these, these guys. And that's where we get, um, you know, this is, this is for, let, let's say, one particular case. But what is the average correlation of the situation, right? And the answer is, if you do that, what your correlation should look like, so what happens if we perfectly match? I know, I'm going to switch it in a minute. <laughs> so suppose now, so suppose now I have something like 1, Minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 1. I only am stopping at 6, okay? Okay. So what happens is, so let's say that's my, my, my PN sequence, right? If I don't offset these by any amount whatsoever, what, what sh like, you know, and I take the definition for the correlation of this guy. So let's say M, I forgot what the subscript is, it's C, okay? So this guy is C. And that's C. So let's say this guy for m equals 0, what it should be equal to? 6. Exactly. Now, let's do this more neatly. If we now do this for 1, so what I mean to say is I offset this by 1. What is the correlation now? And remember, what happens is the PN sequence has a circular symmetry to it, right? Right? So what happens is, now I take this guy, let's offset him by 1. So now I have 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1, and then this guy carries over back. Multiply the two together, what do you have? 1 minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. Wow. Okay. So essentially, we have four minus ones. We have two ones. So we have two, right? And you guys see the trend that's developing, right? The maximum. We have uh, minus two. Minus two, thank you. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm just. OK. 
come on, play with. Technology is not agreeing with me today. Minus two, thank you. What happens is, notice that this guy here is going to be at a max, and that makes sense. They're perfectly aligned, and otherwise, these guys are going to be much smaller. Problem, the problem is not so much this, okay? So as I mentioned before, um, this does a good job. Like, M sequences in terms of this autocorrelation property being approximately white, and the longer the sequence, the whiter it is. Like six, you know, you're, you're going to have bumps and stuff all around, right? 13, same thing. But 256, it's going to look pretty darn random, except for the peak. And the peak, the separation between the peak and everything else is going to be humongous. If L, you're going to have something that's 256, and then you're going to have minus ones, minus twos. Yeah, that's sufficiently distinguishable in terms of being white. Pro the problem comes up with the periodic cross-correlation. It turns out, it turns out that when we look at, let's say, one PN sequence generated this way, and another one. So, you know, this is something like an exercise for the reader, the student, the individual watching this, okay, is the following. I, actually, I think this would be fun. Like, if you can't sleep and you, have to, and you wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning and you need something to, to, you know, just like make you go fall back asleep, this is it. Although I make no promises. So let's say you take your shift register. Okay? Let's say that's 256. Make it, no, 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 better yet. Make it a th uh, Try this again. There we go. Make it 1,024. And take this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Take a random assortment, random number, and produce an output. Call it C1 and do the exact same thing with a different set. Okay? Call him C2. And now find the cross-correlation between the two. Right? So find out what R, C1, C2, M is equal to. What would be really interesting to see is do you have something, ideally, the cross-correlation, these two things should have absolutely nothing in common. Right? That's, that's what I'm hoping for. So the correlation should be like Zippo. But reality, what you might have instead is something that might look like something like that. Well, it should be symmetric, right? But what happens is, that's what I'm worried about, is these like partial correlation hits, right? You want these signals to be as uncorrelated as possible. And that's why M sequences are not really um, like, you know, all that great. Especially for very long sequences, there's always that risk, oh, partial hit, boom. Because there's a good chance that you'll have a subset of a pattern that really matches or correlates strongly to something in another sequence, okay? So again, if you're not sleepy at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, which I think most of this class doesn't have a problem with, <laughs> you know, especially end of term. I think, like, you know, yeah, like, when my head hits a pillow, it's out. You know, I think most of you are probably the same. So what you want to try out instead is something called gold sequences. So I'm only going to give an example, but gold sequences, what happens is what it does is it takes not one, but two M sequences and combines it together. Pretty ingenious. And what gold sequences does is essentially it, it combines these two guys. So this is a gold sequence case with length 31. And what this guy has over the regular M sequence is it avoids the cross-correlation issue that I described. Okay? So if you really want something hardy and you want to avoid cross-correlation issues with other PN sequences, and at the same time, you also want to have um, decent um, 
uh, autocorrelation properties like what we talked about before, this would be the way to go about it. Okay? I don't have any proofs to show that. Um, however, if you do look online or you do, do research and you find, let's say, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if he actually, if Gold actually wrote about his sequences somewhere. I bet you he's in like a transaction somewhere. Find out how he implemented it. Just like Weinstein and Ebert. It's the exact same, you know, this is one of those seminal work type of things. Okay? So that, folks, is PN sequences in a, in a nutshell, right? So there's a lot more to this, obviously, right? But, but really, the concept is you are creating these things. You're probably going to implement it on a chip or something that fits on your cell phone and scrambles up your communications. But then you have issues, like first of all, you have correlation, so you have to choose these sequences right. And then you have the synchronization issues of the phones, how you despread properly, and all this jazz. So for things where you have low probability of detection, low probability of interception, spread spectrum is great from a direct sequence perspective. But you, your hardware, especially if you're doing it at very high data rates, it's got to be pretty, pretty souped up in order to match. And that's why we have things like multi-carrier spread spectrum, because you have low data rate subcarriers, and you're spreading those. So the chip rate, the, rate, the relationship between the chip rate to the subcarrier data rates or symbol rates is actually pretty decent as opposed to single carrier spreading, which is unbelievable, especially if you have a high symbol rate already. All right? So what we're going to do is touch upon lightly this idea called frequency hopping spread spectrum. So this is, you know, end to end, what a frequency hopping spread spectrum communication system looks like. So you know that this obviously makes me want to draw how this looks like and operates. You know, it's just like, no, seriously, ever since I did my undergraduate course in the drawing thing, I said, I'm going to do everything like this now. So the way frequency hopping works is like this. I'm going to draw a spectrogram. OK? So this is time, and that's frequency. So my communication system. Right now, it's communicating on this frequency channel. Let's call it F10. So there are 10 channels. And it's communicating for this time duration, T. Right? And so it's like, yada, 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 you know. Yeah, that's exactly how wireless communication systems communicate. Then all of a sudden, it, F10, the signal in F10 shuts down at time t1, and suddenly it starts turning on or resuming for t seconds on channel f2. Then at t2, which happens to be t seconds later, it goes to f6 and com continues to communicate there for another t seconds. So what ends up happening is my signal hops from one channel to another to another to another. And in, in, if you look at it, like let's say Bluetooth, which I believe has 76 channels. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone remembers their Bluetooth standard. What happens is, what you've got is essentially 76 channels that this guy is transmitting across. And it just selects randomly this narrowband signal. I'm going to transmit here, 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 here. It's almost like the wireless equivalent of dodgeball. So I'm going to ask a question. How many people here played dodgeball when you were young? OK. Were you good at it? How many people are good at it? Ooh, OK. There are some people like, you know, OK. I, I think we should have a dodgeball rally. OK. I was never good at it because I was the big slow idiot that they always got first. It's like, oh, there he is, boom, and then the ball flies, and it's like, ah, out. So what happens is, this is kind of the wireless equivalent of that. What happens is, now I'm here, now I'm here, now I'm here. And the reason for that is it makes it very difficult to jam, right? To the outside user, what happens is I'm just in every which way, I'm just hopping frequencies, right? So 76 frequencies, that's a lot of frequencies to jump around. 
And you might wonder, OK, how do you keep track? How does transmitter and receiver keep track of it? Pseudo-random noise sequence. So what happens is the PN sequence there is used to dictate, now at this time instant, I'm going to be at this frequency. And so what we require is transmitter and receiver to have the right PN sequence, and they're both in sync with each other in order to know what the pattern is, right? And so the beauty of this technology, although it's narrowband, is it's really difficult to sort of figure out, unless you observe it for a very long time, right, how it's hopping around, right? And so you might ask, OK, what happens if this guy hops into a jammer or a jammer catches up to it? OK, oh, bummer. So I lost all the data or a good portion of the data in that hop. I still have 75 other hops that I can make up for it. So you use coding, you use other sorts of techniques in order to recover that information or retransmit it. OK? So frequency hoppy spread spectrum essentially um, does exactly that. So, it's a, so in this case, what it, it uses is it uses an FSK modulation, OK, Fre uh, frequency shift keying. So here, 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 here. So there's that. You have a mixer with a PN sequence and a frequency synthesizer to nudge, let's say, that, that signal. You have the channel, and then you unmix it, and you go through the D mod for the FSK. In case you want a really cool diagram for your notes, that's what, that's what a pattern for frequency hopping looks like if you describe it in terms of a spectrogram. Oh, spectrograms are my friends. Because you look at both time and frequency at the same time. So what happens is um, your frequency hopping, like your Bluetooth headset, does exactly this. Basically, your Bluetooth on your car and your phone will say, oh, let's see if we can align, OK. And then your whatever music you're listening to, your phone conversation, all of that jazz, if it is jazz, depends on what your tastes are, um, all of that information is now in sync with each other. And what's kind of nice is, again, what I mentioned, even if you jam, even if, let's say, 10 out of the 76 hops are interfering with another Bluetooth device, that's fine. Because what's the percentage of jamming incidences there? Like, just, just very naively, because we're going to go through the analysis very briefly of how you compute what the actual, like, you know, performance of the system is. So 66 over 76, that's still not bad. I'm getting most of my information across. If you use coding, which most communication systems do, I can recover from, let's say, being interfered with from other Bluetooth devices. I'm cool. But otherwise, like, unless... There are 76 Bluetooth devices working at the same time, in which case everyone's jamming. What's the likelihood that your patterns are going to, oh, hit, oh, hit? It's not so bad, right? So let's look at slow frequency hopping systems, OK? Let's say one hop per bit, OK? So what we want to do is essentially we assume that the interference is broadband. Okay, which means that it has additive white Gaussian noise uh, characteristics and it has a PS, PSD of J0. So we've seen that before, right? Thank goodness there's no duty cycle in this one. So what happens is, um, we, you know, and the thing is, this is all going to be just very much back of the envelope approximations. FSK, we're just going to use sort of like these, uh, um, you know, these shortcut sort of um, end of derivation type of solutions. We know that the probability of error for FSK when it's binary FSK is 1 half e to the minus rho b over 2. Okay? Or, and that rho b is equal to e b over j naught. Okay? If you had noise, it would be n naught, right? But we're, retro we're assuming no noise. It's just the jammer. Okay? So this is the closed form solution for binary FSK. So what we do, uh-oh, so we're making the assumption here. <laughs> we're making the assumption that this guy here is going to be uh, pass band, OK? If it was low pass, then we'll have the 2w on this sucker, right? So what happens is if we, we use the same expression as before, and we have now slow FHSS, OK? So what we want to do is 
you know, we can express, first of all, that uh, EB, the energy per bit, as um, the, uh, that rho, rho uh, no, PS, okay, uh, the, uh, the symbol uh, transmission uh, power times the bit period, which is going to be equal to PS divided by R, okay? And what happens is we have J naught as being PJ, okay? Pro the, the jamming power divided by the bandwidth, the spreaded bandwidth, okay? Oh, no, sorry, the bandwidth of the broadband, no. The signal, yes, yes. Huh. So the SNR, um, which in this case is that rho B, can be expressed as instead of E B over J naught, we now rewrite everything like what we saw before. Okay. So W over R, the processing gain, and the jamming margin, right? Just like this direct sequence spreads. So what happens is the FHSS system is vulnerable to partial band interference, and the reason for that is imagine if half your hops end up being hosed. Half your hops are being jammed, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? You have your pattern, you know, so here's an idea. Maybe this is a research question. Maybe an adaptive selection of PN sequences. So let's say you know that, oh, suddenly this guy comes along, and he's a wideband jammer, and he's jamming half of my frequencies, the left half of my frequencies of my frequency hopping pattern. And like, you know, you have a cognitive radio that says, aha, I'm being jammed in this half of the frequency. I'm going to change my PN sequence. I'm going to somehow have to communicate that to my receiver, and I only hop in the remaining portion of unaffected spectrum. Oh. Mm. Travis, make a note. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. So what happens is, again, the wideband jammer, flat PSD. And so... What we want to do is, first of all, the PSD of the non-zero portion is defined as J naught over alpha. Hey, what's that? Duty cycle, right? But this is a frequency one. This is not, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, you know, so ranges between zero and one. So we can, well, except, can it include zero? No, because it explodes, right? But what happens is, essentially, you know, what is the non-zero portion of, of that, um, uh, of that PSD, like where is the interference energy present? And this is, this guy says, okay, this alpha term represents, okay, th this this is the percentage of the energy that's actually affecting this signal, right? So, if we do the math and we plug that J naught in, right, with that duty cycle, <sighs> so what happens is we'll see that. The, the, the received binary FSK signal will be jammed with probability alpha. So what happens is this term tells you how much of that spectrum across frequency, not time. Remember, we talked about pulse jamming in the book, and there was a few homework problems on that, is in temporally, we're trying to figure out the duty cycle. How often does, how long does that pulse jammer last out of the entire time period, right? This is how much of the frequency, how the percentage of the bandwidth where the frequency hopping is happening, how much of that bandwidth is being interfered with by this jammer. Now what's interesting is, assuming that every frequency that I hop to is visited at least once during this entire process, it's uniform, right? So whatever percentage is being jammed, that's a, per, uh, like, you know, the, whatever percentage of the bandwidth that has energy, interference energy in it, is the probability it's being jammed. Right? Capiche? So, as a result, we translate that back into the expression for at binary FSK, and we get now the alpha term inserted into the row B, which is that signal to noise ratio business. Okay. What happens is, otherwise, if there's no interference in the remaining portion of those hops, I'm not being interfered with probability of error is zip, is zero. There is no S and R because it's all S, no R. Uh, no. All S, no N. R is like infinite energy, you know? Ah, fantastic. So when you take the average of the two, how do you average this? You take zero and multiply by one minus alpha. That's the percentage of, let's say, times portion of the frequency band that's not being jammed. And the probability of error is zero, and you take the part that is being jammed, which is the, the P2 expression over there, 
multiply by alpha because that's the percentage of time that's being this probability of error happens. And, you, and of course, there's also uh, like some sort of, well, why is there a 2? Oh, because there's a half over there. And this guy gives you the overall average probability of error of such a scenario. Very simple, like, you know, we didn't go into too much detail and stuff, but back of the envelope calculation, if someone says, okay, quickly, tell me, uh, what is the performance of a frequency hop uh, spread spectrum system when 70% of the band's being jammed by a white band jammer? Oh, here you go. Ah. Of course, it's not impressive. You can't make a journal paper out of that. Do other, do other users interfere like in CS? Ah. Okay, so do other users interfere? And the answer is, right now, we are assuming just a single user and a jammer. And that's the thing. So, hmm. So it would be really cool. And you know, this is a great performance analysis. Suppose we have multiple jammers. What's, so let's say, let's say, let's say we, we don't assume a wideband jammer. We assume multiple frequency hopping spread spectrum systems. What is the probability that at any given time, a hop will interfere with each other? Worse yet, what is the probability that in two consecutive hops we're jamming at the, we're going to be jamming consecutively and then we build it up to three hops consecutively and four and five so now we're getting into some sort of combinatorial type of um, probability calculation but and then what happens if we have three guys four guys five guys six guys so i think that that's the thing we're not addressing that here it's just simply here i am mr happy fhss and then here's bad guy, wideband jammer dude. But what happens is if we look at multiple frequency hopping solutions, then, then, then we, have to calcul we have to take a completely different tack because they're all narrow band jammers with each other. And this will actually affect performance greatly. Like if you have like 20, 30, 40 Bluetooth devices. I'm not sure, has, like how many Bluetooth devices have you connected to like in a network? Probably one, right? Like the little headset or, but like imagine you have five or six or seven I, I wonder about that. I, I think it would be worthwhile to do it as an exercise. Good question. Okay. So with that, uh, this concludes lecture 34. Yay. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break. That's enough for everyone to run off and get coffee. <laughs>